What does the future hold for data and analytics, especially in this age dominated by artificial intelligence? Well, today I'm delighted to welcome Irfan Khan, Chief Product Officer at SAP, onto the podcast. In today's episode, we'll explore how SAP Datasphere is introducing the concept of a business virtual data fabric, allowing the data federation without the need to physically move data. And Irfan will shed light on the critical role of preserving data context and metadata for training high-quality generative AI models. I also want to talk a little about how SAP is leveraging knowledge graphs and vector stores for advanced AI capabilities and talk about, of course, the importance of data quality, lineage and ethical usage to ensure a responsible deployment of generative AI along with a few exciting real-world use cases and stories along the way. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to the UK so you can join me and Irfan as we go on a journey into the cutting-edge world of data and AI with some pretty inspiring insights from a true industry leader. But enough from me. Let's get Irfan on the show now. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell everyone listening a little about who you are? And what you do. Well, Neil, thank you so much. Firstly, I appreciate the opportunity to connect with you today. If it was a radio station, I would be first-time caller, but long-time listener. <laughs> I have listened to your uh, your podcast for some time, and, and I know you have some very broad-spectrum discussion. So a little bit about myself, Irfan Khan. I'm uh, at SAP now for about 12-plus years. I arrived through an acquisition, uh, a company called Sybase, where I was there for 18 years. So in my entire career, I've effectively spent most of that time in, in data and analytics. My current role and responsibility is that I'm the chief product officer of SAP's data analytics uh, technology. So I'm running a, a development organization. Uh, very fortunate to work with some very talented colleagues. And we're working on the cutting edge, right? So all the new innovations around AI and course, planning and, and predictive and all the other pieces that you, you would associate with data analytics, we've been working on for quite a number of years now. And as a long-time listener, first-time caller, you'll know one of the things I'm fascinated by on this podcast is my guest origin story. So I'd love to find out a little bit more about how you got into your current role. Can you share how you got into the tech industry, where that passion for tech came from? Maybe something lit the spark, but there's always a story there, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think my, my ambition in technology goes way back, and I've got to maybe attribute that to, to my father, who... Um, Sadly, passed away about a year plus ago now, but uh, he certainly was a, a very significant, you know, not just a role model, but also one who gave a lot of guidance. And, you know, I remember going back in the early, early days, you know, back into school, uh, starting off with the first batch of, I guess I was in the first batch of students that were given the opportunity to formally get into computer studies and computer science, right? So the ambition was certainly there from the beginning. I didn't know a career could be could be had in in this domain 30 plus years ago. But as I look back now, I mean, the origin story, I think, will be driven by two key, key key factors. The first one being having a keen interest and and really being motivated by technology. And the second one was really finding myself landing on my feet with one significant role uh, at Sybase, where I was the chief technology officer, and then landing an SAP, an applications company, so completely different a departure from what I was used to, from pure technology in, into the applications domain. I was fortunate enough to really have a, another rebirth as a career. I went into sales, right, which sounds a little odd from having spent all my life in te- you know, technology and product. But I spent seven of the, or actually probably eight of the last 12 plus years in sales, right? So that in itself gives you a, a very substantial point of view around what customers really care about, what their motivation is, and ultimately what does it take to take a product into, into conception by a new customer. So a lot of that is really grounding me in terms of some of the challenges and and opportunities that we see on the horizon in SEP. And I don't want to date you here, but if I take you back one more time to those school days, what was the computers that you were using in the school? For for me, I'm a I'm a very old guy now, so it would have been a BBC Micro with yeah, 30, not far 32K off. Of RAM. Yeah, so so if you remember, the B, there was a kind of a big sort of standoff between Amstrad right and BBC yeah. Micros, right? So I was an, I was in the Amstrad camp. Uh, CPC four six four to be precise, right? So <laughs> it was it was a very ancient thing. It had a tape a uh, cassette recorder in it. So, you know, you'd go and copy the games with your friends. I shouldn't say that, right? But you copy the <laughs> games and you stick them into the cape, tape recorder and only find out at the uh, 98th percent of loading the game that there was some error, right? So uh, I, I feel the real first world problems that you and I went through. 100%. Those tape dropouts, man. Like, like, there's old 
could have an old podcast episode dedicated to that. But of course, it would be that path. Although the computing back then was quite primitive to what we have now, that path would eventually lead you to SAP. So can you tell me more about the business and, and the problems that you're addressing for your customers at the moment? For, for sure. I mean, maybe just building on what you said, I mean, the the historical compute foundations, the compute and store foundations, I remember my first, I would call it proper computer that I ended up doing my my final year project on as I was an undergraduate at the time. It had four meg of so main memory and 20 20 gigs of, of storage and and that was able to run at the time it was, it was a project that was running on oracle actually at the time funnily enough uh, and you were able to run the entire rdb mess in four meg right with a 20 megabytes worth of storage so look i think if you look at sap today we we're at the pioneering end of business applications i mean the company celebrated its 50th anniversary not too long ago and in these five decades it's really supplanted itself as really being the world leader in business applications and you can pick any industry, whether that's going to be healthcare or it could be you know, financial services or pharmaceutical. SAP has a real stronghold in, in 20 plus industries. And if you imagine companies run their businesses in various business applications, SAP maps its business applications to the entire company. So front office, middle office, back office. And you could imagine that the level of robustness that you need to have if you're a Centrica or if you're a Nestle or if you're a you know, a, 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 you know, McLaren or whoever it might be. These are very large organizations in very different business models. And SAP maps its business applications to to, mar- to marry up to the exact requirements and the demands of those businesses. So very, very interesting sort of to look at the applications evolution of SAP. But I think right now the problem that we're solving is the evolution. In, we'll get into some of the Gen AI topics in just a moment. But those first class business processes that have been robust and running for, for decades now have to evolve. And then when they evolve, course there's two levels of efficiencies that customers want they want the price to come down in terms of running those operations and the applications but equally they want the value of those applications to really guide them almost like the front headlights of a car making sure that they point in the right direction and help them really navigate the the, the twisty roads ahead as well it's amazing just how much has changed i mean you mentioned four meg of ram there and for a lot of people that's like a photo on their phone and uh, I'm looking at the iPad Pro recently, and the the latest version's got 16 gig of of RAM, which is more than a MacBook. It's just phenomenal how how quickly it's increasing, isn't it? And how we take that compute power for granted almost. Absolutely. I mean, if you imagine that the that top level iPhone now has a terabyte worth of of storage, which isn't yeah. physical sort of spinning disks anymore. It's all in memory storage, effectively. So it's incredible to think how how much efficiencies have been gained and and the level of micro-architectures that we now are in the palm of our hands. 100%. And if we fast forward to present day, of course, we're now specifically here today to talk about SAP's data and analytics portfolio and, of course, the latest edition of SAP's data sphere. So for anyone that's not familiar with that, can you just give me a rundown of exactly what it is and ultimately what you're aiming to achieve, what kind of problems you're solving here? Yeah, so if, Neil, if you look back over the last several decades, we've seen a substantial maturing in the in the data and the analytic space, but there is still a lot of old school uh, mentality and and uh, pro- practices that go on. And as an example, I'll give you a practical home example. I mean, if you were today uh, about to move home, you'd probably go through a process where you have to go and look for all of the different sort of I don't know call it paperwork that you may have, whether that's in your filing cabinet, it could be maybe in the, stuffed in the kitchen drawer, it could be bills that you paid and you still want to have some records for and that could be up in your attic. And you tend to have to look at this data in, in some historical context, but more often than not, businesses have to have that access, whether it's for regulation or compliance purposes, but they don't always know the reliability of the data and sometimes they don't know where the data physically is. And if we look at the evolution of data architectures, some advocates, meaning some vendors, have advocated for building a very large filing cabinet, let's call it a data lake today, and they're asking people to move all of their individual silo different sort of data sets and physically move them into this new large filing cabinet. That comes with a level of frustration, cost, and at the same time, a lot of heavy lifts. And, And not a lot of people have the aptitude or the desire to want to become data janitors, right, where you have to go look for all the different pieces of information. And if you marry that sort of practical home example now into the enterprise, where you do find large organizations constantly looking at trying to drive efficiencies and storage and rationalizing all the different data sets, what Datasphere introduces into the market is a concept of a business virtual data fabric. 
And this is a fabric would describe itself. I mean, the physical fabrics are typically stitched together with multiple different pieces, but you don't always have the ability to move physically all the different attributes, or all the different data sets into one location. So it, it's built around the concept of federation. And what is federation? Well, it means that you don't physically need to move the data. You can access it remotely. And there's a couple of trends, I think, that are supporting this now, where if you look at the, the manner in which infrastructure is evolved, you look at the hyperscalers, or which you, know, you consider Microsoft, of course, Google, and, and, uh, and Amazon, right, as very significant players in the, uh, in the space of infrastructure, uh, they have introduced very substantial levels of compute and store and infrastructure around networking. And, and those le- networks are becoming very significant and low-latency based as well. So it's actually a lot more accessible now to look at data in multitude of different locations. You don't need to have all data physically available in one location. So the notion of federation is very key. And the second part is that when you start building next generation of applications, you want to build the foundations of the technology once and build the applications on top of that, not constantly having to evolve the next filing cabinet and the next version of the filing cabinet as it may be, and this is exactly where we see Datasphere really resonating well with the market. We have over 1,400 customers already, and they're building the next generation data foundations on Datasphere, networking within the open ecosystem, which I'll come on to in just a moment. But that kind of hopefully gives you a bit of a summary around why we're excited about Datasphere and how it maps to the existing IT landscape. And one of the things that put you guys on my radar was a large part of SAP's Datasphere proposition is centered around the power of generative AI. And I think we must have broke a record on a tech podcast for going 15 minutes without talking about Gen AI. But can you tell me more about that and, and also the importance of utilizing contextual data? Absolutely. So the, the, let's start with contextual data because that's a very yeah. good starting point. I mean, the majority of data that you have because of this uh, the, the extract and moving data from one environment to another environment typically will result in you losing that metadata or the context. Take, for example, in a business application like SAP, where you may have uh, financial data or ledger data, uh, the concept of an invoice, for example. And the minute that you move that data from the source system, and it doesn't need to be SAP, it could be any source system, and you copy that data, you typically lose those contextual, contextual parts. With Datasphere, maintaining context and is ensuring that the metadata is preserved really helps itself towards model training. So in the AI space, in particular, quality of data and having well-informed models and building models that are not going to hallucinate left, right, and center is a very critical part. And with the benefits now with, with the data sphere, we've really put the two additional components within that. The concept of a knowledge graph, which is a, a very sig- significant component that most Gen AI foundations were built around, and also vectorization, vector stores, right, which are there to support tokenizing and making sure that you can vector into the context of the data. So imagine that you've got looking for similarity of data within a very large data set. Both the combination of the vector store and also the the knowledge graph will give you the means to be able to have much more clearer, coherent generative AI models created or accessed. So this is another key element of why Datasphere is really building itself as a credible capability, right, and foundation for the next generation of IT. And I think there is often more hype around the, the technology itself than some of the problems that businesses are aiming to solve here. So just to bring to life what we're talking about, are there any examples you can share of customers that have already embraced this way of thinking and are seeing real business value, seeing measurable results? Bill, if you take a look at the, the supply chain, majority of supply chains today are built around some signal management, right? So you have to look yeah. for disruptions. Let's assume the Suez Canal, as it was recently reported, you end up with challenges, right, where now you've got this huge backlog convoy effect and, and your supply chains have been disrupted. The fact is that before that information was actually even publicly available, meaning to the to the news agencies, lots of disruptions would have been noticed already within the supply chain. There would have been probably some knock-on effects maybe manufacturing plants were already finding that there was a scarcity of different components. So in the Gen AI world, right, you'd want to be able to link all those signals together and build models around that and then train those models. So as and when you see inference changes in, in sort of market climates and conditions, you can actually start behaving differently. And so therefore, I would look at the entire supply chain, taking a look at the whole foundation in processing around manufacturing. Is But one example in the industry, there is huge levels of advancement that have been made now. Certain customers 
I can't name directly, but they've already started looking at how is it that they should start informing their manufacturing processes around making sure that they can interpret those signals, but from a, not from a traditional sense where you have to run a report at the end of the day and find out that there's a disruption that you may have a week from now. You want to be able to look at this almost in near real time. So there is a whole, whole level of new dimension of use cases that can be built if you have the right level of data with the right, le- right level of granularity and making sure that you can have the hopefully the lack of the hallucination that goes on so you can really rely and trust in the decisions that you can make around this infrastructure now and i think decision making with gen ai can only be as strong as the data that feeds the technology and i suspect that everybody listening has encountered the garbage in garbage out problem at some uh, point in time so what are some of the risks businesses face if that data isn't up to scratch i suspect this is a, a question you get a lot yeah i mean Neil, if you take a look at the majority of IT, it's always got a handbrake. And by handbrake, I mean a kind of a virtual handbrake that people can visualize. And that handbrake is typically a day's worth of old data before you make a decision. Making decisions against real-time data, certainly industries, and I would probably point out maybe financial services where they have evolved, they've probably got less of a forced handbrake because of the level of investment or, or, or capabilities that they've baked in to some of the decision making. And whereas majority of industries today, they look at historical data and they try to make sure that they can forecast and predict for the future. The the foundation of quality in data is really an industry in its own segment. You take a look at data, you look at master data, or you take a look at data quality. These attributes are typically there and have been around for a long time. And now in in the space of generative AI, it sort of almost puts a turbocharger on that. Because as you said, garbage in, garbage out, you want to minimize the amount of data uh, sort of uh, quality issues that you have, duplication of data, deduplicating data as the case may be, ensuring that you have a very clear lineage of the data, knowing where it came from, was the data of a reliable quality source. And typically what will happen is that if you end up with the farther away that you get from the source of the data, meaning that you took an extract and that extract was put into another system, which was then duplicated into another system, you know, it's almost like a family tree. The farther out that you get from the family tree, you can't really have a, a strong level of understanding of the of the parents and the and the historical, the hierarchical view of where the data came from. So there is a lot that's going on, and we are certainly developing lots of fail safes. We have our ethical models around Gen AI. We're putting a lot of emphasis in making sure that the quality of the data is never compromised ethically, and of course from a cultural cu- cultural point of view as well. You know, making sure there's no cultural biases in that data. A lot of stuff is going on in order to make sure that we can really build upon the foundation of this new, you know, mega trend that's upon us. And it's such an important topic because I think last year there was a lot of concern around sensitive corporate data being used to train LLMs, and for the most part, we've overcome a lot of those problems. But those concerns are still very real for a lot of business leaders listening. So how do you manage the data privacy risks and generative AI? And what are some of the safeguards that need to be in place to be able to use this technology responsibly and, and as you said, ethically? I recently listened to one of your podcasts, in fact. It was around about the financial transformation and how Gen AI can be used to be able to support that. And that's probably a good starting point because if you take a look at the uh, the financial data and looking at it more or less from a point of view of of integrity and coherency and and making sure that data is is not going to be misleading to shareholders or even internal C suite executives and you now multiply that out into into society right where the vast majority I mean looking at this case right now it's a very sad situation in in the NHS the National Health Service in the UK where you know the the whole of the blood tests and all the other stuff that got contaminated. Maybe that's a historical maybe reminder, but it's one that's still ever present today. The data privacy aspects, whether it's patient, client information coming from a variety of different sources, it's putting an even higher level of, of integrity around that for most of all corporations because nobody can, can actually bear having one of those public scandals okay, right, on their balance sheet. It just They will not be able to survive. And whereas before, people could sort of ride them through and people will be probably less maybe tolerant of, of, of maybe, or not tolerant, sorry, they'd be more, more acceptant to some of those changes. The reality is right now that you don't get a second chance. So whereas before you could sort of ride it through and have probably less checks and balances, now everybody will have to have a high degree of conformity. And if I look through the lens of SAP, we actually have put a lot of robustness and rigor behind these processes. You know, we have, before we generate any AI for any of our packaged applications, embedded AI, has to run through our ethical committee to make sure that we're not violating any of the context around the quality or the, eth- or, you know, the, 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 the integrity of that data. There is a lot that goes on 
before a data can actually, or the data models can actually be published. So I would assume that most companies of, of, of repute, repute and of course value will be employing, empl- employing similar things on, the, on their horizon as well. And there's so many exciting things happening at the moment. There was the open AI video last week. There's talk of it being integrated into Siri possibly in the future. And you also got it right at the heart of the, or the eye of the storm almost here. So in terms of data management, what excites you about the future and are there any other insights that you can leave us with today or anything that excites you in particular? Yeah, you're right. I mean, if you take a look at the OpenAI sort of announcements around ChatGPT 4.0, and then you look more importantly at what Google is then doing in response and what Meta is doing in response. And this is where I think it becomes almost going back to the uh, the, the early 90s and the mid-2000s where I was uh, very much deeply into the data space, knowing exactly, like, for example, if Sybase was to make an announcement, you could almost guarantee that the next, next text event Microsoft and Oracle would follow suit. And I think innovation was really thriving at the time. Arguably, over the last probably five to seven years, I wouldn't say things have been stagnant because you only need to look at some of the big tech startups that have have really flourished. But if I look at what's exciting me right now is what's next? I mean, you look at Google all of a sudden now, they're really trying to get back into the the mindset of people, not just from a pure search perspective where they've had a dominance for, for decades now, Take a look at some of the things that they announced. They announced, they announced something called Gemini Live, for example, which is a chatbot where you know you have a serious like assistant or whether it's going to be Alexa, but there tend to be one-way traffic coming from those assistants. You can't really stop them, pause them, interrupt them and say, hey, look, you know, I need more context. I don't understand what you're saying here. And having that two-way dialogue with Gemini Live as it was announced from Google is, is very interesting. And then they start introducing things like, you know, for the creators, uh, I think there was something called Google Vio uh, they announced, right, where it can generate a 1080p video for you uh, at a high level of quality. and You can influence it. What do you want the backdrop to have and generate a, a very substantial, you know, video sort of creative thing within a minute, right, or a minute worth of content. Lots of things are on the horizon, but that's all kind of in the, in the space where individuals and your general purpose users will take advantage is, What's exciting to me is really what SAP is planning and bringing it home, I guess, if I may, you know, maybe a bit of a, uh, a, p- a plug here, so to speak, on what's on the horizon for SAP. With business applications today, one of the fundamentals is that you rely upon business applications to make key decisions. But those decisions, typically, as I've described, have become very much part of the fabric of, your, of, your, of the way that you run your business. The way you want to grow and expand your business is this is where Gen AI will really help you a lot, right? In terms of being able to establish some very clear indicators of success. And for example, if you take a look at recruitment and the way that recruitment works today, more often than not, you go through a very you know detailed process. You end up with candidates, you bring them in, and sometimes you know the the whole impression or first impressions are lasting impressions. That doesn't hold true in them in, in, in this time frame, right? You you want to make sure that the majority of, of people that you bring in are going to be able to help you drive innovation to the next level. And what does that mean? Well, it's a certain profile of person that you need. So in our success factors business, for example, introducing generative AI and having a means of being able to really help screen candidates ethically. And from a point of view of making sure that the data that's being used is is then informing the, the foundations of success for the future. Looking at it from a business applications perspective, having access to all of the data that may be sitting within your within your corporation and building models and training models and having context. There's so much that we can now do with business applications that wasn't achievable before. And when you add in partnerships like, you know, whether it's going to be NVIDIA that give you even greater levels of performance around the same data and training data, there's a lot that's going on. So I think, Neil, I would summarize and say that a lot's going on in the industry right now, lots of moves by the large players, lots going on in open source, which I think like whether it's Meta with Llama 3, their contributions that they're making, there's going to be a lot on the menu of CIOs and CDOs in the future. And that's probably another podcast in its own, own, own making. So as I said, first time caller, but long time listener. And I'm looking forward to, to hearing more from you in the future on these topics. And it's, there is an open invitation for you to come back and discuss some of these topics as well. And uh, just listening to you, there, I mean, keeping up the pace with the speed of technology can be incredibly overwhelming for a lot of people listening. And the last few weeks alone, we've heard about text-to-video, open AI's announcements, phones and tablets that are more powerful than laptops. It's a long, long way from those BBC micros and 32K of RAM. And there is this pressure to continuously learn now. So I've got to ask, where or how do you self-educate? How do you keep up to speed with the uh, trends? Yeah, I think once upon a time, we would go on these structured courses. It was a five-day course on topic A, and then you'd come back, and then you earned the uh, the sort of the foundational principles and go on to course B, which would be another three days. 
that that whole historical learning uh, was was probably ready for the time or, or acceptable for the time, but now it's all just in time. Uh, YouTube videos are a very good source. I mean, great content providers like yourself will create uh, sort of snippets of, of content that you can use and then build a talk track around and build a foundation of knowledge around. So my self-learning journey is, is driven by two components. One is lots of interactions and networking within within corporations like, you know, of course, the customers that we work with, but equally so internally with some very, very bright minds that we're fortunate enough to have at SAP where, you know, a lot of brainstorming goes on. And But it's a bite-sized learning digestive right now. I mean, like if I look at the Reader's Digest of the past, it was, you know, something that was end to end and, you know, cover to cover that you had to read. Now you get your information in, in very small bursts of packages. We're living in the of course, the TikTok generation, right? And content and, and training and learnings comes in those same size packages. So lots of lots sort of uncoordinated searching and networking where you start from point A and maybe it's a YouTube video set that you're looking at and you could end up probably looking in the Amazon jungle, right? Before you even notice that you were there. But this all sort of leads towards the, uh, you know, the un, the un sort of choreographed training and learning, I think, which for me works really, really well. And we've covered so much about your life in this 30-minute podcast interview today. From your school years, the, the, how your father inspired you and the computers you were using at school, et cetera, to where we are now. And, of course, as we now come full circle, I'm going to ask you to look back at your entire career because none of us are able to achieve any degree of success without a little help along the way. And very often we encounter people that see something in us, invest a little time in us. So is there a particular person that you're grateful towards who maybe helped you get where you where you are that we could – Give a little shout out at the end of our conversation to that. And Neil, thank you for the opportunity to maybe highlight. I mean, I, I, if I was to put down who has helped me along my career, it would be a long list. And yeah. obviously, there will have to be a top five or a top 10. You've got to make the cut at some point in time. And I would say without hesitation, I mean, one particular person who steps who stands out for me is Dr. Raj Nathan. He was a, both a mentor and also a, a very significant leader that that I was able to use to to shape my own leadership credentials. And Dr. Raj Nathan and I worked together for almost a decade at Sybase in my formative years, really working, uh, understanding exactly the domain of technology, what's possible. And, and he had a lot of leadership qualities. You know, I remember just, I'll give you one incident just to sort of wrap this up on a, maybe on a more of a personal note. I mean, he was at a very lofty height. He was part of the executive leadership team of Sybase at the time. I'm a lowly sort of individual. He and I were traveling together. He had, of course, a, you know, first class or business class ticket at the time. We were both transiting to the airport his flight was delayed of course we we're on the same flight and rather him sort of saying i'll see you on the other side and going into the lounge right and, and you know maybe resting himself you know for the for the long flight ahead he decided to sit with me in the in the uh, in the regular area right and we were just talking and discussing life in general and that had a profound effect on me right in terms of it doesn't matter how high you get up in any organization understand that you were starting at some point in time at a at a much more singular individual contributor level and it's important to have that level of engagement so for me dr raj nathan certainly will be a standout individual mentor teacher and of course somebody that i aspire to try to be like as well wow what a powerful story and one of the reasons i asked that question is be probably blissfully unaware of how just investing that extra little bit of time with you sitting down and having a conversation and how much that will inspire you and maybe inspire you to act the same when you rise up that ladder too incredibly powerful stuff and for anyone listening that just wants to find out more information about anything we talked about today and explore SAP's data and analytics portfolio, obviously SAP is a huge website. Is there anywhere in particular you'd like to point out, everyone? Uh, so if you go across to the SAP.com, uh, it's well structured. I think we've got a data foundation. The business technology platform will probably be the good starting point, which gives you the jumping point off into the data, the analytics, the planning space, in addition to the whole pro code, no code area as well. So a lot of related technology segments, we call it the business technology platform. And I think that will be a very good starting point. Well, it's been a huge pleasure talking with you today. I think we covered a lot there from Gen AI, how it's powerless without contextual data and how keeping data clean for AI requires adapting to each specific data landscape. And also for helping business leaders understand how they can begin to practice better data hygiene for responsible AI use. So much gold in our conversation. As I said earlier in the episode there, there's an open invitation to get you back on and explore some of the other topics we flirted with today. But more than anything, thank you for joining me today. It's been a tremendous pleasure, Neil. Thank you so much. Wow, what a fascinating discussion there with her fan. And I think his insights into SAP's data sphere, the importance of preserving data context and the ethical deployment of AI have all been incredibly enlightening. 
and Irfan's deep understanding of how data and AI can drive innovation across industries, I think provides a valuable perspective for everyone listening today. So I want to extend a special thank you to Irfan for his patience during our recording today as well. As some of you might know, I was having a new boiler fitted today, which meant I was using portable mics and connected to 5G due to having no electricity. But it was incredibly understanding and professionalism from today's guest that made the recording a success, despite some slightly unusual circumstances on my side. But as for everyone listening, I hope you enjoyed today's episode as much as I did. We'd love to hear from you, your thoughts on today's discussion. What stood out to you about the future of data, the future of AI? Let me know your insights. Join the conversation by emailing me, techblogwriteroutlook.com, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. Just at Neil C. Hughes. But remember, stay curious, stay innovative, keep exploring the limitless possibilities of technology. But more than anything, thank you for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger.